So thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure to be the first one presenting, um, elected in this uh, democratic and open way. Um, <laughs> that was like democracy. So um, uh, my name is Fabrizio. Um, I'm going to talk to you uh, about uh, surveilling democracy through modest means. I'm, I'm based in Uruguay, Montevideo. Uh, and I coordinate a project, uh, kindly supported by the Open Society Foundations, uh, but unfortunately I don't get any money from that, I'm essentially chairing the project, so, uh, not in Mr. Soros' payroll, but uh, essentially the project is supported by, by Mr. Soros. Uh, and um, essentially we're exploring, um, exploring the connection uh, between privacy, surveillance, uh, and, 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 and democracy in Uruguay. Uh, and this part of the work we have been uh, doing in Uruguay and Latin America more generally. Um, so, a bit of context. Um, so, in Uruguay, this is a small country that is not Paraguay, and if you have seen it, <laughs> down there. Uh, so, that's in yellow, it's not Uruguay, it's actually down there. Um, uh, you know, it, this is a place where there has been a lot of uh, acquisition of surveillance technology, uh, particularly for interception of communications, uh, acquisition of predictive policing software. Uh, Expansion of CCTV technology, biometric controls at the border, contacts with the hacking team. I don't know if you know those guys. Amazing people, Italians, like my family. Mm. Nice guys. Um, but, but, I mean, very smooth, uh, but very bad at, at actually hacking. Uh, and, um, <laughs> and also, Uruguay is considered a full democracy. Actually, the only one in the Americas with Canada, according to the Economic, uh, the economic Unit Index. Um, but it still is a developing country, so we are very democratic, but not as rich. Right? Um, so the way I decided to frame this uh, is trying to understand uh, these ideas of surveillance regimes and democracy. So the idea that uh, surveillance in itself is not bad or, or good. Surveillance just, just happens. It's a, it's, a, it's a natural outcome of the digital world in which we live. Uh, actually, it's the other side, the other side of a coin. Uh, of transparency. I mean, the minute uh, government officials put out their records, uh, you are able to surveil government. And that's something we actually see as a good thing, as a democratic value. But on the other hand, the more information you put out in Facebook, Twitter, whatever you are using, other people are surveilling you or are looking at you, if you want. Uh, and that's that's just, you know, I, I take a more um, realistic approach. This is, this is what's happening. I mean, I, I, and as an assault, uh, when the state engages in this, is when essentially a surveillance regime uh, kind of configures. And I sort of define this as uh, essentially network of agencies operating on a set of common ideas, rules, and practices involving collecting, capturing, analyzing, and eventually acting on data gathered from their surveillance activities. And, and essentially, uh, there are a few variables I'm looking into, like complexity, as in how many agencies do, you, do, do participate in these surveillance activities? It's only one. It's like uh, 100. Uh, I don't know. Whenever we, it depends on the country, the level of coordination these agencies actually have. Do they talk to each other? Do they compete with each other? Um, um, the regulation behind that? Uh, the accountability these agencies actually uh, develop? And the technological maturity of these regimes? Are we, are we dealing with people here basically intercepting cables, uh, like in the old days? Or, or are we dealing with people like the NSA, collecting vast amounts of data and intercepting cables, right, like the internet backbone, and actually getting, getting the data out of that? Uh, so in Uruguay's case, it's a complex surveillance regime. We have, uh, we have uh, many uh, agencies working. Most of them are working uh, at the Ministry of uh, Homeland Security, but also at the Ministry of Defense, and also at, uh, at the Secret Service, which is not so secret in Uruguay after all, it's only three million people. But, um, but it's, it's, very, it's a complex uh, kind of uh, place. It's at least six or seven agencies involved. It's fragmented, they don't talk that much to each other, and there's no uh, common, uh, common thread or common regulation to essentially rule this system, this regime. It's essentially, as I say, not regulated. We don't have a general law on intelligence services. We don't have a general law on surveillance. Uh, we, we don't have, basically, also as a result of this, clear lines of accountability for these agencies. So who are they accountable to? To your minister? Maybe. Are they accountable to parliament? Not really. There's no parliamentary community following this. Are they accountable to society? Can you feel a freedom of information request to actually understand what on earth is happening there? No. 
Uh, and so as a result, you know, it's like they are accountable to themselves, basically. Um, and, and, I mean, you technically can file that freedom of information request. I tried. Surprise. Like, I didn't get that much information out of that. Um, there's low, low technological maturity, or there was low technological maturity, I mean, until 2012. Uh, these agencies wouldn't have much to, to, to do. They would be very unsophisticated in the way, in the way they surveil uh, people. Uh, but it's not modest anymore. What you're seeing there is a picture of Punta del Este, one of the best resorts in Latin America, um, but also a place where there's a massive CCTV system in place, uh, actually funded by, uh, by DUI and government and in partnership with the Ministry of Defense of Israel. Uh, and thanks to, to them, we have this beautiful 200 cameras operating there with software able to predict your movements and potentially with software able to track you across the city if necessary. Also paid by the taxpayers in Punta del Este, which are not particularly happy about that because not all the cameras are in place. Um, El Guardian, we actually bought that from a Brazilian firm um, and it's able to intercept your communications. It's able to intercept up to 600 conversations uh, about landline and cell phones and potentially as well to monitor to monitor um, um, social media. We also bought from an American firm a predictive policing tool uh, able theoretically to predict where the next outbreak um, is, is, is happening in, the, in, in Montevideo mostly, which is the capital city. So we roughly, we spent around $20 million uh, over a period of four years without any sort of public scrutiny. Like none of these contracts are actually public. We got, we got to know about this because Somehow, uh, the general controller uh, observed uh, the expenditure, actually letting us know that these contracts were not according to our accounting practices, uh, but no democratic uh, discussion about this. Like, it's more an accounting issue. So no modest anymore, basically. We are, we are on a shopping spree. Uh, <laughs> so, so, the, the, so what's the problem with these technologies? Uh, and I could go into detail. But, but the, 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 the problem here is how you frame this. I mean, like, I am not particularly optimistic about Uruguayan government rolling back all these uh, purchases. I mean, some of them are already gone. Like, the licenses were very expensive. So the Uruguayan government figured out of, of actually changing those technologies or using its own technologies because, like, the predictive software tool, at the end of the day, uh, the systems in UI were able to do more or less the same job that, that this particular predicting tool. So they decided to drop the license. That was fairly expensive. But I think we, we need to discuss, basically, I'm, I'm not optimistic about governments actually rolling back their, um, their surveillance technology. I mean, like, I'm pretty sure they will keep buying these things, they will keep evolving, there's a market. So I'm, I'm taking a more, uh, if you want, um, realistic or, or, or damage control approach. And I think that there are some issues that, that we need to discuss about these surveillance regimes, like how much surveillance does a society need and which agencies should deliver it. And, and some key questions in a democratic society are the ones that I, I tried to phrase there, which I took from, from Marx, not from Karl Marx, but from Marx at the MIT, which is a, a professor who has been working in surveillance issues for a, for a while. And so, for instance, like, will those responsible for the surveillance, both the decision to apply it and its actual application, agree to be its subjects under the conditions which they apply it to others? Um, you know, do we have a public decision making about these tools? And then, obviously, you have policy tools that you could use, like uh, privacy and surveillance law addressing the principles of proportionality and necessity of surveillance technology. <coughs> Most of that stuff is just not there. I mean, how do I run a surveillance operation at the moment in Uruguay? How I want to. <laughs> uh, I mean, in, in defense of the Uruguayan regime, um, there is a requirement in law uh, that needs uh, the authorization of a, of a judge, basically, to run this operation. Uh, but that requirement comes from a very fragmented uh, law, and there's no requirements about necessity and proportionality of this. Also, there's no evidence-based public debate about this. I mean, we are essentially talking about this into the dark. And there's no a clear clarification of the competencies of these agencies, like who does what, when, and how. We don't know that, and we should, basically, if, if we are going to have these technologies operated. The other issue is about the technology to be incorporated, incorporated in these regimes. And as well, you know, there are some key questions democratic societies should address. 
And there are not right or wrong answers. I mean, like, if you live in a country that's very worried about uh, state security, namely Colombia, for instance, mm. uh, well, okay, you might be much more uh, on the spectrum of, you know, I really want surveillance technology in my country. I, I wouldn't support it, but if, it's, if this is a result of a democratic kind of discussion and people are really keen on having cameras everywhere, it's not great, in my opinion, but that's okay. I mean, you have a democratic process and you are aware into what you're getting into. <laughs> At the moment, we don't know what we're getting into. Um, so, in any case, for all this technology, I guess that the register of surveillance technology providers, public versions of this technology, uh, and standards of accepted technology to perform surveillance activities should, should be there. At the moment, we don't have that. We are just buying from people we don't know what kind of stuff they are selling. It's like, if, like, if you're buying drugs, you're buying from, from the neighbor that has some dodgy way of getting the drug and you're getting it. That's not good. I mean, like, if you, as with other kind of activities, it should be, if you're going to legalize that, at least, you know, <coughs> set up proper standards, set up proper mechanisms. Uh, how might, how, by twice? Okay, great. That's good. Uh, so, again, the, the, the other issue as, as well is the accountability in a surveillance regime. And I think that this is very important in terms of how citizens actually engage with this. At the moment, if I am under surveillance of the UYN state, I have no way of knowing this. Uh, I could use the privacy law trying to uh, get information about it. But I think it's, it's important to, to get also clear rules for accidental third-party data collection. What if my friend happens to be a very nasty person that is under surveillance for good reasons, and my conversations get captured, and suddenly I'm in the database, I'm next to this guy, I didn't know. <laughs> and there's no rule whatsoever that say how the information should be disposed after an investigation. That's just not there. Mm. Or what if the Uruguayan government decides to buy malware because they actually want to infect uh, a computer of a guy doing child pornography, and, this, and they need that because they need evidence, basically, of you know, of get, to get evidence and to get this guy to jail. But they use it against me, who happens to be a normal citizen that actually that don't engage in these activities. Um, that's there as well. Uh, so we need those those lines of accountability very clear. And and I guess that one of the of the issues like. Uh, that, that, it's, that keeps coming is, is as well the right you have to know that you are under surveillance or you were under surveillance and the right you have to know who was accessing this data about you and that's not very clear and it's not only for surveillance purposes or for state surveillance purposes but also from the capitalism surveillance we are constantly around like, like literally like who is accessing my data so we have more in stock uh, Software analyzing camera and CCD footage, hacking team meeting, I think I mentioned that, biometric scanners spreading everywhere, significant amount of information about citizens publicly available as your credit rankings in UI are publicly available. We know your credit card ranking, ranking and how much credit are you taking and that can potentially be used against you depending as I can go into that. Uh, and no general regulation. So what should be done? We need to regulate surveillance activities, including purchase, use, and evaluation of technology. We need to enhance privacy law, including the right to check who has your act, who has access to your data. Sorry, I got it wrong. Enhance horizontal and social accountability arrangements, and limit the purchase of this kind of technology, and potentially enhance civil society and media. Like literally, the debate of these topics in Uruguay is close to zero. Like there's only a few journalists following this, and a few civil society people able to engage in this debate. We are not able to have a public debate on this. Mm. And, and, and bottom line is that, as a general thing, we don't have conversations about how to limit surveillance in our countries or what kind of surveillance we want. And we should find methods of doing that uh, because at the moment it's not a conversation. It's more a conversation in the dark, uh, you know, essentially a few people have, but not regular citizens. And, and there, there has to be a way of doing that. Uh, and also in the developing world, I think there's another Logic thing that has been happening is that some financing institutions like development banks, they have been rolling these technologies and sometimes for good reasons like security can be an important stuff in, in, in Latin America. Uh, but if you are buying dodgy software that you are unable to control and you are unable to open and you happen to be a financing institution, I wonder why you're, what your stakeholders are going to say about you. Uh, and there are no standards about how you lend money uh, for these particular operations. And I think that's just not acceptable. That we, again, we should have a discussion not only on the level of security we want, or the level of surveillance we want, but also who is going to pay that and what role, essentially, the, the providers are going to have. Um, and yeah, 
that's it, 15 minutes. Oh, oh. <laughs> this is a regional update. Uh, how can surveillance can undermine democracy? Mm. Uh, Using Texas lures government spyware targets Mexican journalists and their families. Okay. Uh, this actually happened yesterday, yeah. um, and 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 basically, uh, what we have here is the use of Pegasus, a software able to infect your 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 cell phone, against people working on the open government platform that Mexican is currently delivering. So they were spying on activists on open government, on, like guys negotiating oh, or bargaining God. with government on open government tables, yeah. using um, surveillance software without their knowledge, without obviously a judge, and so on. So if you are wondering why it is important to have public conversations about this, it's because it can literally undermine open government process everywhere, and as the Mexican case now shows. So thank you very much. My name is Colin Garvey. I'm from uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, uh, RPI, in the Science and Technology um, uh, Science and Technology Studies Department. And uh, happy to be here. Thanks to the organizers and to Tracy for putting on a great conference. I've been really enjoying it. So uh, I'm here to talk about the democratization of artificial intelligence today. So why am I here at a big data power conference? I um, uh, hope I'll explain that in one slide. Uh, I would say we're in the third AI boom right now. So if you'd like to learn more about the first two booms, uh, the first one being affectionately called GoFi for good old-fashioned artificial intelligence, and the second one being based around expert systems and knowledge engineering, um, read Paul Edwards' book, The Closed World. It's really good. He gave a good keynote this morning. And um, you can learn about, uh, I think he does a great job. I, I, I learned a lot from him. Um, or read my upcoming pub on the Japanese um, expert systems um, that ran parallel during the 80s to the American program. It was the uh, other first major uh, non-American AI program that I'm uh, aware of, besides the British. <laughs> Because we're in the third boom now, um, and this is really the data-driven paradigm, okay? So machine learning applied to our data, okay? Uh, you've probably been hearing about how problematic it is. I agree, it is. And there's a lot of social excitement and concern. And with AI in particular, a lot of this has uh, uh, arisen around uh, jobs. So as if you heard the... Um, uh, keynote yesterday, Frank Pasquale pointed out with journalism, right? Um, if they can surveil you sufficiently, uh, learn how you do your job, then you can be replaced. And this is increasingly seen um, as desirable by our uh, Silicon Valley overlords. Um, another big one, terminators, right? Uh, job killers and uh, terminator bots, right? Uh, this really got off to a start when Stephen Hawking uh, famously said it could spell the end of the human race. This was about 2014, and this is when I really started my dissertation research. This got my attention. By the way, this is my dissertation research. Uh, Andrew Ng, the um, uh, big uh, Google Brain um, architect, then he was over at Baidu, now he's on his own, I think, with Coursera. Big AI guru says, don't worry, this is like worrying about overpopulation on Mars, essentially. Uh, we're not there yet. Hey, we got this, guys. Um, but actually quite a few AI people came together, about 3,000 of them through the Future of Life Institute signed an open letter saying this is turning into an arms race and we're concerned. Uh, Hawking, Musk, Steve Wozniak, Bill Gates, a lot of people signed this letter, you could too. Uh, unfortunately the letter's done nothing and the arms race is afoot, guys. <laughs> China and America are uh, becoming uh, neck and neck. Uh, developing what they're calling lethal autonomous weapons. So really, I'm not a, a worried at all about some inherent drive in the machine to go kill humans. It's really the militaries that are all about killing humans uh, are using more and more machinery. <laughs> new, not new. So I really encourage everyone to go uh, get involved with the campaign to stop killer robots, stopkillerrobots.org. NGO working with the UN and uh, helping countries draft their own statements um, uh, against autonomous weaponry. So uh, it's a legitimate group. They're very, uh, very good. Another risk emerging, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but um, Zainab Tufeki and um, Kathy O'Neill's new book on weapons of math destruction, right? Uh, AI doesn't need to kill you or take your job to really have a harmful effect 
on your daily life. And I'm sure you've been hearing in other talks about uh, the many ways um, maybe you get uh, turned down for a mortgage because, or actually in the talk just earlier with uh, Fabrizio, uh, what if I'm next door to the drug dealer? You know, there's a lot of problems, okay. So AI is innovative, creating new opportunities, of course, but also many risks. So I'm trying to categorize risks is the first part of my dissertation research, and then look into how can we govern these and deal with these better, mitigate risk. And uh, so I take a democratic approach to that. But essentially, my take on AI. New technology, old problems, right? Research and development, primarily still led by the military industrial uh, university complex. I'm taking that from Thomas Hughes, uh, the human built world there. He adds the university aspect. But we see this everywhere, right? Silicon Valley uh, <clears throat> really emerges from uh, this kind of trifecta, right? Benefits are accruing to an elite minority. If you haven't noticed, social inequality is at all-time high, well, you know, 100 years highs right now, okay? These guys, the rich are getting richer. Uh, oh, the rich get richer, and now there's this new winner-take-all phenomenon where the Googles and the Facebooks actually dominate 90% of internet traffic. So you get a thing where 10% of sites take 90% of traffic, works with profits as well. 10% of companies taking 90% of revenue. So there are many known risks and huge unintended consequences that we need to be worried about and very few people are paying attention to this. It's a lot of breathless hand rubbing about the cash we're going to make. I'm sorry if I'm putting it in too extreme of terms, but I'm worried. And what's maybe most worrisome is that there's a lack of social <laughs> institutions for steering the direction of R&D. It's essentially led by the elite, and that's what I see as the problem. Okay, so what can be done? And maybe more importantly, who gets to decide? So I'll try to show you like three, three things I'm seeing right now. On the one hand, there are the engineers who see <coughs> AI as the end of politics. And so this is a conversation with, uh, I forget who this guy is, but um, <laughs> this guy, Joy Ito over here, he's from the MIT Media Lab. Um, very, very informed guy. And then this is the editor of Wired. And uh, this was a really well-publicized conversation that happened last year at the end of um, uh, former President Obama's uh, term. Joy Ito says, This may upset some of my students at MIT, but one of my concerns is that it's been a predominantly male gang of kids, mostly white, who are building the core computer science around AI, and they're more comfortable talking to, hum uh, talking to computers than human beings. A lot of them feel that if they could just make that science fiction generalized AI, we wouldn't have to worry about all that messy stuff like politics and society. They think machines will just figure it all out for us. I run into this, um, you know, this, this kind of attitude runs back 60 years to the origins of AI. I see this a lot. And um, I think he's totally right. And this, I don't need to explain to you probably, Seems like a bad idea. Second, um, there's this emerging thing of Microsoft-style democratization. So Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft right now, is pumping this um, democratizing aid AI, is what they're calling it. This is an image from their current website. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> they're taking the four-pronged approach. They're going to harness AI and fundamentally change our lives with ambient computing and agents everywhere. We're going to infuse every application that we interact with on any device at any point in time with intelligence. And we'll make these same intelligent capabilities that are infused in our own apps, the cognitive capabilities, available to every application developer in the world. And really the uh, example they use is you could make your own Microsoft Office. Great. Yeah. So, but really, this is a problem, right? So, uh, if you take your kind of a ridiculously reduced notion of an innovation pipeline, they're talking about just down here, right? We'll do all the research, development, prototype, manufacture, and then we'll let you play with our toys after we've made them, okay? No thanks, Microsoft. I think that's pretty superficial. <laughs> no, generous. These new A developer APIs, IBM's doing it, Google's doing it, Tensor. Flow. Um, you know, generous, but it's still problematic, right? Superficial democratization, I would say. So I'm looking more um, two ways, right? Upstream democratization, but more importantly, just taking a notion from Andrew Feenberg, who's written extensively on the democratization of technology. Just a baseline definition for him. He says, democratization of technical change means granting actors who lack 
financial, cultural, or political capital access to the design process. So that's much more upstream, right, in the R&D process itself, okay? And I draw on Feinberg heavily, uh, you know, for this idea of, like, we need to get up there, but how do we actually do that, okay? Um, here is where uh, I draw on my uh, advisor, Ned Woodhouse's framework, uh, he's calling it, for the democratic control of technology through intelligent trial and error. So we're calling this the ITE framework, and I won't be able to get through all of this, but basically the notion is this. There's five categories, uh, and we use this to evaluate how projects are going, an R&D project. This can be used for any technology, but I'm looking at AI. Okay, so five categories. In each category, we have uh, four variables. And then you, have, you can evaluate a project on these variables. We give it a score. We use one to five. So four categories. Or I'm sorry, five categories. Four variables per five points, 20 variables. It's like a 100-point scale, right? We can evaluate a project, give it a number, say this is going democratically and intelligently or not. You know, and, uh, it's a rough reduction, but I'll walk through the first two uh, regarding AI. And um, you get a sense of it. So deliberation, how is deliberation going about the kinds of AI technologies we need and are being developed, right? First variable, is it early in the technology's development? Often, uh, as uh, uh, Dave Collingridge has pointed out, once a technology gets sufficiently developed, it's hard to change. It gets, it gets locked in. So, oh, it's hard to see. Shoot. Is it early in the technology's development? No. This is 50 years since HAL 9000. Imagine if civil engineers had been building bridges for 50 years before they just started to think about, oh, well, maybe we should consult people on this, right? No, it's been a while. We should have been working on it a long time. Uh, yeah, could you feel that? That'd be good. Thank you. Um, is a ma this, is, this is really one of the key variables. Is a maximum feasible diversity of <coughs> concerns being debated? Um, no. The agenda is being set by an elite minority, uh, primarily in Silicon Valley, but also in these centers of like MIT, Stanford, um, <clears throat> CMU, Carnegie Mellon. Um, <clears throat> so no. Um, are participants well informed? Rarely. Uh, and, increasing, and increasingly, machine learning techniques are essentially black box techniques, where even the experts themselves could not explain exactly how the algorithm produced this result. So it become increasingly difficult to be well informed about machine learning techniques. So this is a problem as well. Are deliberations superficial and short or deep and recurring? Um, really, they're just beginning. Uh, there's been a lot of efforts. Uh, there's been conferences in the last year since 2016 on AI for social good, AI and ethics. Uh, I, I've been to a few of these, I'll have to say. Um, d data power has been far more substantial, and I've enjoyed it a lot more. And it's quite superficial. They want to whitewash this stuff and get it through. Second, this will be our second category. How is the decision-making process itself actually structured? Okay, are all significant stakeholders represented in the process? Uh, no, there are very few beyond proximate designers and their patrons who pay for their work. Okay. Uh, hired guns, essentially. Is it highly transparent? No. There are military and industrial secrecy incentives that have been there. Well, if you read Paul Edwards' books, it's a long history of military and industrial secrecy around AI. And that is still the case in many places, right? Um, now more industrial as Facebook algorithms, Google algorithms are kept incredibly secret, right? <laughs> Uh, is the burden of proof well distributed? Okay, so when um, Mark Zuckerberg tells us that AI is going to make all our lives better, is it up to me, the critic, to prove he's wrong because everyone believes him? Right now, it is. Uh, it's borne primarily by critics, okay? We should say to Zuckerberg, okay, yeah, you claim that, but prove it, buddy. Uh, that's not happening. Um, oh, oh, sorry, Fabrizio, what you want to play? What's the thing you... No, my pleasure. Uh, authority to decide allocately, allocated pluralistically or not, right? Uh, no, it's essentially a top-down chain of command. It used to be centered primarily in military centers and uh, university like MIT, CMU, Stanford. Now it's spread out a little more through industry, but primarily top-down, okay? Um, Google execs, uh, Sergey Brin, has plans for us, or Elon Musk has plans for us, okay? 
So, some conclusions to wrap up with. Uh, without intervention, I see AI threatening to exacerbate significantly social inequalities. It's, it's five years away. It's already happening if you read Kathy O'Neill. Next ten years is going to be difficult. It's going to be bad. Fuel post-human military arms races. We're in the day and age where weapons will exceed the ability of humans to respond to them. Okay? They'll operate on speeds that we cannot deal with at a human uh, level. Okay? And it will generally accelerate, I think, the Anthropocene ecocide. Okay? So they're talking about extracting more capital using AI, but they're not talking about ecological solutions to our planetary problems. They're talking about, you know, better social media. I see this. Uh, uh, AI will fuel the capitalist exploitation of our planet's resources. That's my risk. Um, I see the extant risk governance strategies as being ineffective. So the engineers kind of wait and see. We'll just trust the machines. When the super intelligent AI emerges from the box, we'll just do what it says and we'll be okay. Not going to happen, I don't think. And open access, well, we know what the problems are with open access. Okay, You can make something online for free, but um, look at the makeup of a computer science department, or a philosophy department, or an AI department. These are primarily, as Joy Ito pointed out, rich, white, male um, kids. Okay, And um, if you don't have the training to use these tools, you may as well not even have them available online. So. Um, open access and wait and see fail uh, as far as governance strategies, I believe. So, um, I think broader control of the innovation, you know, I'm, I'm, innovation pipeline is not really mine, but broader control of the innovation pipeline is, is needed, okay? Improved awareness of these widespread AI risks, these are, these are shared risks that we might not be aware of, but we're uh, at, you know, uh, uh, facing right now. Uh, citizens' right to participate in technological decision-making. Uh, I mean, a, as a right. In a democracy, we have a sense that we have a right to a say in how legislation is made, but the sense that we have a right to how Google creates the technologies that will shape our lives in the future to come, it's not even there yet. We need to th start thinking about that. Finally, social institutions for steering research and de uh, uh, development democratically. Uh, are desperately needed, and I don't see where they exist yet necessarily, or are effective. So let's work on this, guys. Thanks. Thanks so much. I appreciate it.